ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಸ್ನೇಹಿತರೆ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಇತಿಹಾಸ ದರ್ಪಣ ಹಾಗೂ ಋತುಮಾನ ಡಾಟ್ ಕಾಮ್ ಸಂಯುಕ್ತ ಆಶ್ರಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಜರುಗ್ತಾ ಇರತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಅರಿವಿನ ನಿರಿಗೆ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಸರಣಿಯ ಹನ್ನೊಂದನೆಯ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ತಮ್ಗೆಲ್ರಿಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಸ್ವಾಗತ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮ್ಮ ನಡುವೆ ಇದಾರೆ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ರಿಚರ್ಡ್ ಈಟನ್ ಅವರು ಇಂತ ಸಂದರ್ಭದಲ್ಲಿ ರಿಚರ್ಡ್ ಈಟನ್ ಅವರ ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಭಾರತಕ್ಕೆ ಸಂಬಂಧಪಟ್ಟ ಹಾಗೆ ಮತ್ತು ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಭಾರತ ಮತ್ತು ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ಬಿಜಾಪುರದ ಸೂಫಿಗಳ ಸಂಬಂಧಪಟ್ಟ ಹಾಗೆ ಭಾರತದಲ್ಲಿ ಇಸ್ಲಾಮಿಕ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ಗೆ ಸಂಬಂಧಪಟ್ಟ ಹಾಗೆ ಒಬ್ಬ ಒಬ್ರು ಬಹುದೊಡ್ಡ ಅಥಾರಿಟಿ ಅಂತಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಈಟನ್ ಅವರನ್ನ ಪರಿಚಯ ಮಾಡುವುದು ನಮ್ಮ ನಿಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲರ ಆದ್ಯ ಕರ್ತವ್ಯ ಮತ್ತು ಸೌಜನ್ಯ ಆ ಕಾರಣಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ಅವರು ಪರಿಚಯ ಮಾಡಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೆ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೇನೆ ಆ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಈಟನ್ ಅವರಿಗೆ ನಾನು ಅವರ ಸಿ ವಿ ಕೇಳಿದಾಗ ಸಿ ವಿ ಕಳಿಸಿದ್ರು ಆ ನಿನ್ನೆ ಕಳಿಸಿದ್ರು ಸರಿ ಸುಮಾರು ಮೂವತ್ತು ಪೇಜ್ಗಳ ಸಿ ವಿ ಅದು ಅಷ್ಟು ದೊಡ್ಡ ಪೇ ಸಿ ವಿ ಅನ್ನ ಓದೋದು ತುಂಬಾ ಕಷ್ಟ ಅನೇಕ ಸಾಹಿತ್ಯಿಕ ಮತ್ತು ಚಾರಿತ್ರಿಕ ಬರವಣಿಗೆಗಳು ಕೃತಿಗಳ ಪ್ರಕಾಶನ ಇತ್ಯಾದಿಗಳಿಂದ ಹಿಡಿದು ಅವರ ಪಾರಿತೋಷಕಗಳು ಅವರು ಹೊಂದಿರ್ತ ಅವರು ಪ್ರಿಸೈಡ್ ಮಾಡಿದಂತ ಅನೇಕ ಚೈರ್ಗಳು ಅವರ ಅಧ್ಯಯನಗಳು ಅವರ ಅವರ ಅವರು ಮಾಡದಂತಹ ಬೋಧನೆ ಪ್ರಬೋಧನೆಗಳು ಇತ್ಯಾದಿ ಸೇರಿ ಮೂವತ್ತು ಪೇಜ್ ಇದೆ ಸೊ ಅವುಗಳು ಅದನ್ನ ನಾನು ಸಂಕ್ಷಿಪ್ತವಾಗಿ ಆ ತಯಾರು ಮಾಡಿ ಮೂರು ಪೇಜ್ಗಳು ಗಳಿಸಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಮತ್ತೆ ಅದನ್ನ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಮುಂದೆ ಇಡ್ತಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ರಿಚರ್ಡ್ ಈಟನ್ ಅವರು ತಮ್ಮ ಬಿ ಎ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಅರವತ್ತೆರಡರಲ್ಲಿ ಊಸ್ಟರ್ ಅಮೆರಿಕದ ಊಸ್ಟರ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ನಿಂದ ಪಡಿತಾರೆ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಅರವತ್ತೇಳರಲ್ಲಿ ಎಂ ಎ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನ ಆ ವರ್ಜೀನಿಯಾ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯಿಂದ ಪಡಿತಾರೆ ಮತ್ತು ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಎಂ ಎ ಅನ್ನ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ನೈನ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ವಿಸ್ಕನ್ಸಿನ್ ಮ್ಯಾಡಿಸನ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯಿಂದ ಪಡಿತಾರೆ ಅವರ ಎಂ ಎ ಸಂದರ್ಭದ ಪ್ರಮುಖ ಥಿಸಿಸ್ಗಳು ಹೀಗಿದೆ ವರ್ಜೀನಿಯಾದಲ್ಲಿ ಎಂ ಎ ಮಾಡಿದ ಸಂದರ್ಭದಲ್ಲಿ ಅವರ ಥಿಸಿಸ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ನೈನ್ ನೈನ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಎಂ ಎ ಮಾಡಿದ ಮೇಲೆ ಒಂದು ಥಿಸಿಸ್ ಅನ್ನ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಅದು ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಅಫ್ಘನ್ ವಾರ್ ಮೇಲೆ ವಿಸ್ಕನ್ಸಿನ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಅವರು ಮಾಡಿದ ಎಂ ಎ ಥಿಸಿಸ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ನೈನ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಎಂ ಎ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಕೊಟ್ಟಂತ ಥಿಸಿಸ್ ಅವರು ಎಂ ಜಿ ರಾನಡೆ ಅವರ ಮೇಲೆ ಮತ್ತು ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ಟೂ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಅನ್ನ ವಿಸ್ಕನ್ಸಿನ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಮ್ಯಾಡಿಸನ್ ನಿಂದ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ಅದು ಸೂಫಿ ಸಾಬ್ ಬಿಜಾಪುರದ ಮೇಲೆ ಅವರು ಅವರಿಗೆ ಸಂದಿರತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಪ್ರಮುಖ ಗ್ರಾಂಟ್ ಮತ್ತು ಫೆಲೋಶಿಪ್ಗಳು ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಐದು ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಆರರಲ್ಲಿ ಸರಿ ಸುಮಾರು ಐವತ್ತಕ್ಕೂ ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಸಂದಿದೆ ಆದ್ರೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಪ್ರಮುಖವಾದದನ್ನ ನಾವು ನಾನು ನಿಮ್ಮ ಮುಂದೆ ಇಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಐದು ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಆರರಲ್ಲಿ ಪಾಲ್ ಗೆಟ್ಟಿ ಗ್ರಾಂಟ್ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ನಲ್ಲಿ ವುಡ್ರೋ ವಿಲ್ಸನ್ ಫೆಲೋಶಿಪ್ ಒಂದ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ತೊಂಬತ್ತೆರಡರಲ್ಲಿ ಎನ್ಇಹೆಚ್ ಫೆಲೋಶಿಪ್ ಒಂದ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಎಂಬತ್ತಾರರಲ್ಲಿ ಅರಿಜೋನ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯ ಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಎಸ್ ಗ್ರಾಂಟ್ ಒಂದ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಎಂಬತ್ನಾಲ್ಕು ಎಂಬತ್ತೈದರಲ್ಲಿ ಹಿಬ್ರೂ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯ ಐ ಎ ಎಸ್ ಎಫ್ ಗ್ರಾಂಟ್ ಅಥವಾ ಫೆಲೋ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಎಂಬತ್ನಾಲ್ಕರಲ್ಲಿ ಅರಿಜೋನಾ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯ ಹ್ಯುಮ್ಯಾನಿಟೀಸ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟು ಮಾಡತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಹ್ಯುಮ್ಯಾನಿಟೀಸ್ ಗ್ರಾಂಟ್ ಒಂದ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಎಂಬತ್ತೆರಡರಲ್ಲಿ ಫುಲ್ ಬ್ರೈಟ್ ಫೆಲೋಶಿಪ್ ಒಂದ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಎಂಬತ್ತ ಒಂದರಲ್ಲಿ ಎ ಐ ಐ ಎಸ್ ಫೆಲೋಶಿಪ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಎಪ್ಪತ್ತೈದರಲ್ಲಿ ವಿಸ್ಕನ್ಸಿನ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯ ಕಂಪಾರಿಟಿವ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ನೀಡ್ತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಫೆಲೋ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ಎಪ್ಪತ್ತೈದು ಎಪ್ಪತ್ತ ಆರರಲ್ಲಿ ಫು
ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಯ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಗಿ ಅವರು ಕೆಲಸವನ್ನ ನಿರ್ವಹಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಸದ್ಯ ಅಮೆರಿಕದ ಬ್ರೌನ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಅವರು ಸಂದರ್ಶನ ಪ್ರಾಧ್ಯಾಪಕರಾಗಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಇಂತಹ ಇಂತಹ ಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠ ವಿದ್ವಾಂಸರ ಅತ್ಯಂತ ಗಣನೀಯ ಕೃತಿಗಳು ಹೀಗಿವೆ ಸೂಫೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಬಿಜಾಪುರ್ ಬಹುಶಃ ಇವರ ಒಂದು ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ ಕೃತಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾಧ್ಯ ಇದೆ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇದು ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಡೆಲ್ಲಿಯ ಮನೋಹರ್ ಇದನ್ನು ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡುತ್ತೆ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ತೊಂಬತ್ತೆರಡರಲ್ಲಿ ಆಕ್ಸ್ಫರ್ಡ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡಿದ ಫಿರೋಜಾಬಾದ್ ಫ್ಯಾಲೆಸ್ ಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ರೆಕ್ಕನ್ ಕೂಡ ಇವರ ತುಂಬಾ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾದ ಗ್ರಂಥ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ತೊಂಬತ್ ಮೂರರಲ್ಲಿ ದಿ ರೈಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಸ್ಲಾಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿ ಬೆಂಗಾಲ್ ಫ್ರಾಂಟಿಯರ್ ಒನ್ ಟು ಝೀರೋ ಫೋರ್ ಟು ಒನ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಝೀರೋ ಎ ಡಿ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಕೃತಿ ಅನ್ನ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಕ್ಯಾಲಿಫೋರ್ನಿಯಾ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಈ ಈ ಕೃತಿಗೆ ಆನಂದ ಕುಮಾರ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಪ್ರಶಸ್ತಿ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಏಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಬಂದಿದೆ ಮತ್ತು ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆದ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ನ ಪ್ರಶಸ್ತಿ ಆದ ಅಲ್ಬರ್ಟ್ ಹೌರಾನಿ ಪ್ರೈಸ್ ಕೂಡ ಬಂದಿದೆ ಸಾವಿರದ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಐದರಲ್ಲಿ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಡಕ್ಕನ್ ಒನ್ ತ್ರೀ ಝೀರೋ ಝೀರೋ ಟು ಒನ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನ ಓಯುಪಿ ಕೇಂಬ್ರಿಡ್ಜ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹದಿನಾಲ್ಕರಲ್ಲಿ ಇವರ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆದ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಕೃತಿ ಪವರ್ ಮೆಮೊರಿ ಆರ್ಕಿಟೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಕಂಟೆಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಸೈಟ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾಸ್ ಡೆಕ್ಕನ್ ಫ್ಲೋಟ್ ಒನ್ ತ್ರೀ ಝೀರೋ ಝೀರೋ ಟು ಒನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಝೀರೋ ಝೀರೋ ಅದನ್ನು ಆಕ್ಸ್ಫರ್ಡ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಇದು ಕೂಡ ಆನಂದ ಕುಮಾರ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಅವರ ಪ್ರಶಸ್ತಿಯನ್ನು ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹದಿನಾರರಲ್ಲಿ ಎರಡನೇ ಬಾರಿಗೆ ಪಡೆದಿದೆ ಮತ್ತು ಜಾನ್ ಎಫ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಪ್ರೈಸ್ ಕೂಡ ಇದಕ್ಕೂ ಬಂದಿದೆ ಎಸ್ ಎಸ್ ಆನ್ ಇಸ್ಲಾಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆಕ್ಸ್ಫರ್ಡ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಎರಡರಲ್ಲಿ ಇದನ್ನು ಹೊರಗೆ ತರ್ತು ಇದು ಕೂಡ ಒಂದು ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಕೃತಿ ಒಂದ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಒಂಬೈನೂರ ತೊಂಬತ್ತರಲ್ಲಿ ಇಸ್ಲಾಮಿಕ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆಸ್ ಗ್ಲೋಬಲ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಕೃತಿ ಕೂಡ ಹೊರಗೆ ಬಂದಿದೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹತ್ತೊಂಬತ್ತರಲ್ಲಿ ಸದ್ಯ ಬಂದಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಪರ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಏಜ್ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಕೃತಿ ಒನ್ ಝೀರೋ 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 ಟು ಒನ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಫೈವ್ ಎ ಡಿ ಅವರ ಸದ್ಯದ ಒಂದು ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆದ ಕೃತಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾಧ್ಯ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ದಿ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿ ಲಯನ್ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆದ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನು ಚರಿತ್ರೆ ಮತ್ತು ಸಮಾಜ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನಕ್ಕೆ ಸಂಬಂಧಪಟ್ಟ ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನ ದೆಹಲಿಯ ಪ್ರೈಮಸ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ ಅದು ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡ್ಲಿಕ್ಕಿದೆ ಈಗ ಅಚ್ಚಿನ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಪ್ರಿಂಟ್ ಈಗ ಅಚ್ಚಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಇದೆ ಅವರ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆದ ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ಡಿಸೆಕ್ರೇಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮುಸ್ಲಿಂ ಸೈಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಹೋಪ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಒಂದು ಪಬ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹದಿನಾಲ್ಕರಲ್ಲಿ ಅದನ್ನ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಇದಲ್ಲದೆ ಈಟನ್ ಅವರು ಸರಿಸುಮಾರು ನೂರಕ್ಕೂ ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಸಂಪಾದಿತ ಕೃತಿಗಳನ್ನ ಸಂಪಾದನೆ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಸರಿಸುಮಾರು ನಾನೂರಕ್ಕೂ ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಪ್ರಬಂಧಗಳನ್ನ ಸಂಶೋಧನಾ ಬರಹಗಳನ್ನ ಬೇರೆ ಬೇರೆ ಪತ್ರಿಕೆಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಕಟ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅದನ್ನ ನಾನು ಹೆಚ್ಚ ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಹೇಳಕ್ ಹೋಗಲ್ಲ ಸೊ ಇದು ಬಹುಶಃ ರಿಚರ್ಡ್ ಈಟನ್ ಅವರ ಪರಿಚಯ ಈಟನ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಈಟನ್ ಅವರ ಆಸಕ್ತಿಯ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರಗಳು ಹೀಗಿವೆ ಪರ್ಷಿಯನ್ ಏಷ್ಯನ್ ರಿಲಿಜನ್ಸ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆಫ್ ಮುಸ್ಲಿಂ ಸೊಸೈಟೀಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಫೈವ್ ಝೀರೋ ಝೀರೋ ಟು ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ಸ್ಲೇವರಿ ಇನ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಇಸ್ಲಾಮಿಕ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಟ್ರಾವೆಲರ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕ್ರಾಸ್ ಕಲ್ಚರಲ್ ಎನ್ಕೌಂಟರ್ಸ್ ಮಿಲೇನಿಯಲ್ ಮೂಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ನೇಚರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆಫ್ ಮಿಡಿವಲ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆಫ್ ಇ
uh, visits to Bangalore. Um, the last time I was there was with, with my colleague, uh, Philip Wagner, when we were conducting our research on the Deccan Plateau. And uh, we stayed at the Chalukya Hotel for about a week <laughs> uh, before commencing our research. So that was the best part of the whole, I think, tour was, was, was those several days in Bangalore. Anyway, I wish I could be with you in person, but this is just as, almost as good. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is to, is to, uh, to illustrate uh, how the story of a battle uh, that took place five centuries ago, uh, which is virtually unknown, I should say, in historical literature, uh, how that battle can illustrate a number of themes that span uh, uh, several levels. At the most general level, I want to talk about a worldwide phenomenon, namely the so-called military revolution that began in several parts of the planet in the 14th century. It gathered force in the 15th century, and then it really took off with speed, great speed, in the 16th century. This was when the technology of gunpowder and firearms uh, used both for cannon and for matchlocks. Uh, this is when it was diffusing all over the planet. But everywhere that gunpowder went, it had different consequences, depending on what those who first possessed it uh, actually did with it. And so that's one of, the, one of the issues I'd like to raise with you this evening. At a second level, uh, I want to use this battle to explore a misconception that is found in many histories of India, namely that for hundreds of years, uh, the country had been sunk in perpetual conflict between Hindus and Muslims. In 1996, Samuel Huntington published his controversial book, The Clash of Civilizations, which drew severe lines between civilizations, what he called civilizations, across the planet. Uh, here, for example, is a map of the contemporary world, which he drew in 1996, which severely de demarcates a Hindu India uh, that you see here in orange, uh, or saffron, with the Islamic world to its immediate west represented in green. One could hardly imagine from this map uh, that South Asia today is home to more Muslims than inhabit the entire Middle East. But Huntington was not alone. For years, historians of pre-modern India have drawn a, a very sharp line across the midsection of India, uh, to be precise, the Krishna River in the, in, the, in the heart of the Deccan Plateau, imagining that there was somehow a Muslim north and a Hindu south uh, of, of that river. So the battle I want to discuss today will, I hope, will throw some light on this question and also to the, the, the mistakes of carving up the world along these kinds of civilizational lines the way that Huntington did. A third level uh, of this talk explores the lives of ordinary people with a view to showing how this battle brought out characteristics that are common to all humans across all times and places. Greed, revenge, triumphalism, weakness to liquor, compassion, and, and much more. Uh, they're all exhibited in the three central actors who figure in this story, namely Krishnaraya, uh, the king of uh, the great uh, kingdom of Vijayanagara, Sultan Ismail Adil Khan, uh, the Sultan of Vijayanagara's arch enemy to the north, Bijapur, and Cristobal de Figueroa, a swashbuckling captain of the Portuguese infantry who lent his military services to one of the two players in this battle. So, uh, in the battle that I describe, and here, by the way, is it, uh, c contemporary images of Krishna Raya and Ismail Aldo Khan. Uh, and here are images of Portuguese matchlock men in India. Uh, this is from a carpet that was woven in the mid 16th century. So it's roughly contemporary with the, the period that the Portuguese were active 
uh, in the Deccan Plateau. So in the battle that I want to describe here, I want to bring out a, a number of registers. Uh, there's this, as I say, there's the story of India's military revolution. There's the story of Hindu Muslim encounter. And there's the all too human story of how individual players behave in moments of stress. If there's a fourth register the, to the talk, it would be the level of how historians evaluate data and evidence, especially when that evidence is contradictory, tendentious, or incomplete. I mean, I always thought that doing history of any sort uh, is something like uh, doing a jigsaw puzzle in which most of the pieces are missing uh, and many of the pieces are of the same color uh, and you have confusing shapes. Uh, so the art of doing history is always an imperfect science because you never have all of the data. You can only work with what you do have, uh, which is what I'm going to be trying to do today. So a little background here. Uh, the battle that I described, the Battle of Raichur, was waged in the summer of 1520, and it was waged for the control of the strategic city of Raichur. Now this fortified center is located in the middle of this rich uh, sliver of land between two rivers that run through the heart of the plateau. For several centuries before the battle took place, sultans of the Bahmani kingdom to the north of Raichur fought with the rulers of Vijayanagara to the south over control of this very rich fertile strip of land with Raichur located right in the middle as you see here on the map. Actually this region had been a contested zone uh, even before the Bahmanis and Vijayanagara uh, came into being. In 1294 a regional king of the Kakatiya dynasty had seized this tract of land and he built it, an imposing complex of walls and gates that encircle the core of Raichur city. So you see here on this map uh, the inner wall uh, constructed in 1294 by the Kakatiya uh, kings With their massive slabs of finely dressed granite, these walls were in their own day considered an engineering marvel. Here we see the actual uh, part of the old Kakatiya wall uh, at, uh, at Raichur. Even today, residents of Raichur imagine that these walls must have been built by gods, not by men, because they are so massive, so huge, and so perfectly cut. But in the early 14th century, rulers of the Delhi Sultanate invaded the Deccan, swept away all the states of the region, and systematically colonized the northern Deccan with settlers who had been transplanted from North India. At the same time, the invaders subcontracted governance of the central and southern Deccan to local client chiefs. But then in 1327, one of these chieftains threw off allegiance to the north, to the Delhi Sultans, and carved out a new state that sprawled across the entire southern half of the Indian Peninsula. Uh, this was the kingdom of Vijayanagara, a powerful state governed from the sprawling metropolis of the same name, located just south of the Raichur Plain, or Doab. Several dynasties of kings ruled from this splendid city, which by the 1400s was described by Europeans as larger than Rome or Lisbon. So here we see some very familiar uh, monuments or the, lands, the landscape of Vijayanagara. You see here in this image the uh, Tungabhadra River, which is on the northern edge of the city. Uh, and here is the heart of the, the, the oldest part of the city, uh, the temple of uh, uh, Virupaksha in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the downtown part of the city. And here is in the kind of the royal center uh, where they, the kings of Vijayanagara uh, in the southern part of the city had, had their quarter. And here's one of the watchtowers uh, that are part of the familiar architecture, stunning architecture 
uh, of, of Vijay Allegra today. But Raichur did not remain uh, in the hands of Vijayanagara for long. Uh, in the confusion that surrounded the expulsion of imperial rule of the Delhi Sultanate in 1347, Raichur fell to the other power that simultaneously arose on the ashes of Delhi, Delhi's failed attempt to colonize the Deccan. Uh, this was the Bahmani Sultanate which ruled from a series of capitals north of Vijayanagara, as you see here in this map. For 150 years, rulers of Vijayanagara and the Bahmani Sultanate fought bitterly for control of the agriculturally rich Raichur Plain. But for most of this period, the plain remained under northern control. At this time, in 1469, Bahmani engineers capitalizing on technology imported from North India and from the Middle East, built an entirely new wall that encompassed the old city. So here you see uh, the second wall in dark color, built in 1469, constructed by the Bahmani sultans. And here is an image of uh, that part with very different kinds of stone, as you can see. Uh, with these bastions projecting out into a moat which surrounded the old Bahmani fort, uh, as you see in this image. So here you see the outer wall, which then crawled up the hill, uh, and on the top of the hill is you were looking out over the Raichur Doab uh, from Raichur Fort, as you see here from the top of the citadel. Um, but shortly after completing these fortifications, dissensions within the Bahmani ruling class led to factional struggles, and by the year 1500, the kingdom had fragmented, the Bahmani kingdom had fragmented into five new successor states. And you see them here on this map. Barar in the north, Avanagar in the northwest, Bijapur in the west, Golconda in the east, and the Sultanate of Bidar uh, occupying the heart of the old Bahmani kingdom in the center. Uh, and the, the sultanate and controlled Raichur was Bijapur, uh, which inherited control uh, from, uh, also from the uh, strategic seaport of, of Goa. But by the opening of the 16th century, the balance of power between the Northern Deccan and the Southern Deccan was swinging back to the South, meaning that uh, the, the great kingdom of Vijayanagara, which by this time had conquered all of the Southern part of the peninsula, uh, was now threatening these five sultanates to the North. In 1509, uh, the man who ascended to the Vijayanagara th throne was Krishnaraya, who was one of the most famous kings uh, of Indian history. Under him, Vijayanagara annexed the entire peninsula down to the southern uh, cape, thereby amassing immense manpower and capital resources. Uh, also, it was in Krishnaraya's 20, 20th year, 20 year reign uh, that Europeans began to sail to India's shores for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire. These were Portuguese mariners who, following Vasco da Gama's voyage from Lisbon in 1498, built up a powerful commercial and military presence on coastal India. Moreover, having just driven Muslims out of Europe, or at least out of the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, these conquistadors were especially hostile to Muslims. And since Bijapur was ruled by a Muslim sultan, Portuguese strategists naturally made overtures to Krishnaraya, uh, who was the Hindu ruler of Vijayanagara. So you, begin to, you can begin to see already how Europe was intruding itself into the geopolitics of the Deccan Plateau. The Portuguese possessed several assets in their drive for political and commercial dominance along coastal India. First, by achieving control of the Arabian Sea, the, 
Portuguese monopolized control over the valuable trade in war horses, which Indian rulers had been importing from Arabia and Iran for centuries. Second, the Portuguese introduced new kinds of gunpowder technology to the Deccan Plateau. Now, to be sure, gunpowder was already known and used in India long before the advent of the Portuguese. In the 1470s, Bahmani engineers in the Deccan were using artillery and matchlocks in their campaigns. A major infusion of gunpowder technology reached Western India in the years after 1508, when Ottoman Turks sailed into the Arabian Sea to engage Portuguese warships off the Indian coast. Following that engagement, some Turkish gunsmiths stayed behind, stayed in India, and took up service with the sultans of Bijapur, working at the arsenal in Goa. At Goa, at that time, had been under Bijapur control. So this would explain why, when the Portuguese attacked and conquered Goa in 1510, the victors found that the Bijapuri defenders had already established their own munitions plant in that city. In fact, Afonso de Albuquerque, who was the mastermind of Portuguese operations in Asia, was so impressed with Goa's gunmaking tradition that he sent to the king of Portugal samples of the heavy cannon used by the Muslims of that city. He also sent uh, the molds from which they had been cast, and he sent several gunsmiths uh, to Lisbon in order to teach the Portuguese how to make the kinds of cannon that were already being produced in Goa. In fact, in 1513, Albuquerque reported to the king of Portugal that the gunsmiths in Bijapur were able to turn out iron cannon and matchlocks of a higher quality than anything produced even in Germany, which at that time was considered to be uh, making the, the best uh, fire firearms in, in the world. What is more, Albuquerque persuaded Bijapur's gunsmiths to stay in Goa and work for the Portuguese. So in this way, a tradition of German and Bohemian gun making that the Portuguese had brought to India now merged with Turkish gun making traditions that were already present in Goa. So you have now a hybridized product uh, that has been called the Indo-Portuguese tradition of matchlocks, which you see here uh, in, in this image of a contemporary uh, matchlock weapon. Uh, these were superior to anything that was then produced elsewhere in India. And contemporary images that depict Portuguese soldiers in West Africa as well as in India illustrate how these Indo-Portuguese lock mechanisms uh, had evolved in Portuguese Goa. So here we have an image of uh, Portuguese soldiers uh, this is a bronze image of Portuguese soldiers in, in Africa, and you look very carefully, you can see the matchlock mechanism here. Uh, the same thing here, again, in this carpet that's woven in the mid 16th century, and we can, we can just see the actual image of the, of the matchlock uh, on the right hand side of this image. Now this chart is fascinating because it looks like a genealogy. In fact, it is a genealogy, except instead of a genealogy of people, it's a genealogy of, of how the matchlock uh, system migrated from Germany, Nuremberg, Germany, uh, down to uh, Bohemia. <clears throat> and then from Bohemia, it was taken by the Portuguese to Goa uh, in the center in the, with the, the red circle you see here. Uh, <clears throat> and by the mid 1500s, uh, the, the Indo-Portuguese matchlock then diffused, continued to confuse to Sri Lanka, to Malaya, and as far as Japan. So you, you, you can see here the kind of the evolution and the migration uh, of this particular system. Uh, <clears throat> nonetheless, uh, despite the rapid diffusion of gunpowder technology, in India and in the world. Before 1520, we hear of no major battles in which firearms were used in the Deccan Plateau or anywhere else in India. 
That would change with the Battle of Raichur. This battle was the first battle in which firearms were used in the interior of India. So it's a very important battle. Uh, and we have for our sources two uh, contemporary or roughly contemporary materials. One of them uh, is by uh, Muhammad Qasim Firishta, 1611, who wrote his famous Tariq Firishta, the history of Firishta, uh, dedicated to his own patron in Bijapur, the Sultan of Bijapur, Ibrahim II. He was the grandson, I'm sorry, the great grandson of Ismail Adil Shah, who was the ruler of Bijapur who fought in this battle. So he is describing a battle uh, that was waged 90 years earlier uh, in a history dedicated to the great grandson of the participant of that battle. The second source is by a Portuguese uh, horse trader, Fernão Nunes, uh, who wrote his history in 1531. Uh, it's a a chronicle of, of Vijayanagara based on local traditions and also based on his own interactions with Indians uh, during his long stay at Vijayanagara. Uh, <clears throat> now, Nunez might have lived on coastal India ever since 1512, in which case he would have heard firsthand reports uh, of this battle shortly after its conclusion. Indeed, it's possible that Nunez was recording these, uh, his, his, his book based on traditions some eight years after the battle uh, from participants in the battle. In fact, most intriguing is the possibility that Nunez was actually an eyewitness of the battle because when you read his account, he's talking in the present tense, in the present continuous tense, as if he had actually been there watching uh, the battle unfolds. So this source is very important. And you can see that of these two sources, uh, Ferishta is less trustworthy, not only because he was writing 90 years after the fact, but also because he had to account for the, uh, the crushing defeat of his patron's own great-grandfather. This is always tricky when you're writing for a patron uh, who is related to a participant in the battle. Uh, Ismail Adil Khan, the great grandfather of, of uh, Ibrahim II, not only lost the Battle of Raichur, but he lost it in a spectacular way. So I want to talk about these two accounts in turn. Uh, first of all, according to Firishta, in the spring of 1520, Ismail Adil Khan took 7,000 cavalry down to the northern uh, uh, shore of the Krishna River in order to recover the fort of Raichur from Krishnaraya of Vijayanagara. On learning about this, Krishnaraya brought up a much larger cavalry of 50,000 to the southern shores of the Krishna River. Here, Firishta introduces the factor that doomed Ismail's project to failure. While the Sultan was resting in his tent, after pitching camp on the northern shore of the river, one of his courtiers proposed a drinking bout. The Sultan responded enthusiastically and promptly got so thoroughly drunk that he decided to cross the river and attack his adversary at once. Although his officers pleaded for more time to build the necessary boats and rafts, Ismail ignored their advice and mounting his elephant, rode directly into the river, plunged into the water, and ordered his, his officers and men to follow. But when he reached the river's southern shores, the Sultan confronted Krishnaraya's host of cavalry, and finding himself trapped between the Vijayanagara army and the river, Ismail and his forces retreated in panic and disorder. When they tried to re recross the river, virtually the entire army was cut down by the arrows of Krishnaraya's pursuing forces. The Sultan, who himself barely escaped this debacle, 
sank into remorse for his rashness, and he swore off wine forever. So in this way, Ferishta frames the account of the battle as a morality play. The basic point being that this disaster was the fault of wine, or more correctly, uh, the Sultan's weakness in succumbing to drinking wine at a very inappropriate time. The account left by Nunez, on the other hand, is far more detailed, and above all, it is contemporary with the battle. So we have to focus on this book, this Portuguese record. According to Nunez, Krishnaraya had entrusted one of his Muslim merchants with 40,000 gold coins to take to the western uh, coast and buy war horses uh, at the seaport of Goa, which was then under Portuguese control. But instead of doing that, this merchant absconded with the money. He took it to Bijapur. This so enraged Krishnamaya that he decided to use this incident as an excuse to invade the fortified city of Raichur, which he and his predecessors of Vijayanagara had long coveted. So in early 1520, the king moved north with an immense force of 27,000 cavalry and, according to Nunez, over a half million infantry. The bulk of the army consisted of archers, swordsmen, and war elephants, and only several cannon. By contrast, Ismail Adil Shah had fortified Raichur with 200 heavy cannon and many smaller cannon, which he positioned uh, along the, the curtain wall and the 30 bastions of the outer wall of the fort. Whereas the fort's defenders fired on Vijanagra's forces with their cannon and matchlocks, the besiegers of Vijanagra used no artillery against the walls. Instead, Krishnaraya ordered his commanders to offer the men monetary inducements to approach the wall and dismantle the, the stones of the wall with crowbars and pickaxes, paying these men in sums proportionate to the size of the stones they dismantled. So this is a very labor intensive and crude way of taking down the, the fort. He's not using firearms. He's paying his men to bring down these stones one by one and paying them by the size of the stones. Of course, many men were killed uh, in, this, in this manner. Uh, but nonetheless, they continued to hack away at the wall. And in this dreary way, uh, the siege dragged on for several months. Then in early May of 1520, while the siege was in progress, Krishnaraya learned that Ismail Adil Khan had marched down from Bijapur in order to relieve the embattled fort and was camped on the northern side of the Krishna River. Suspending his siege at Raichur, Raichur Krishnaraya then moved his army up to the Krishna River to prevent the Sultan from crossing and entering into the southern part of the, uh, 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 in the Raichur Doab. Uh, the battle between the two armies then began several hours after dawn on May 19. Having moved his forces up to the southern side of the river, the Sultan fired all of his uh, artillery at once in one mighty salvo directly into the massed Vijayanagara cavalry. When the front lines of Krishnaraya's cavalry buckled, uh, the remaining divisions regrouped and managed to drive. They, they rode around behind the cannon uh, and they drove all the forces of the Adil Shah back into the river uh, and finally into the river. Uh, with, with great destruction uh, to the Bijapur forces. So like Ferishta, Nunez reports a horrific slaughter that then took place by the river and in the river, uh, in the midst of which Ismail himself jumped on his elephant and barely escaped with his life. So it is clear that Ismail brought considerable cannon uh, from Bijapur down to the battlefield. And Nunez tells us that 
his retreating army had to abandon 400 heavy cannon and 500 small cannon on the battlefield, together with 4,000 war horses and 100 elephants, all of it abandoned. In fact, writes Nunez, Ismail boldly crossed the Krishna River, not because he was drunk, as Firishta would later write, but because he was confident that the great strength of his, uh, his artillery would give him a quick victory over his uh, adversaries, cavalry, and infantry. And in fact, the opening barrage of cannon fire that Ismail leveled against Vijayanagara did give him con a, con a temporary advantage. On the other hand, Krishnaraya, who crushed his opponent in that uh, engagement, used no artillery and no matchlocks. So we have a very different kind of battle, a field battle here. On one side, it was all cannon. On the other side, it was basically heavy cavalry. And in the siege at Raichur, which was heavily defended with cannon, the king of Vijayanagara used no cannon to bombard the fort's walls. Rather, as I just said, he used his men to claw down uh, the walls uh, with, using crowbars and pickaxes. So when Krishnaraya returned to Raichur, he resumed the same laborious method of, of besieging the fort. Except this time, a new factor enters the siege. Uh, this is the appearance of uh, a group of 20 Portuguese mercenaries who had joined the forces of Krishnaraya, and they are, they are all matchlock men here. They were led by Cristóvão de Figueiredo. Uh, noticing how fearlessly Raichur's defenders would roam along the top of the, the fort, fully exposed to the view of the besiegers, the Portuguese matchlock men began picking them off with these guns, these, these, these firearms, uh, doubtless using the Indo-Portuguese guns that were manufactured in nearby Goa. Significantly, Nunez reports that up to this point, the defenders had never seen men killed by firearms. That's a very significant point, because it, it, it gives us dramatic evidence that firearms were unknown in the Deccan Plateau at this time. No, they, nobody had ever seen anyone killed uh, by a gun until this battle took place. A turning point occurred in the siege on June 14, when the governor of the city, who was trying to find a better vantage point to view the, uh, the opposing side, uh, walked out onto the top of one of these battlements you see here, and a Portuguese sniper saw him as the governor was leaning out over the top of the wall. And so the Portuguese fired at him and instantly killed him with a, a matchlock shot, struck him in the forehead. The death of the governor of the city broke the morale of Raichur's defenders and they abruptly abandoned the wall. In fact, the next day, all of the defenders of the fort opened the city gate and, and uh, they, they filed out begging for mercy. And the following day, June 16, Krishnaraya rode his horse into the city, spoke to the gathered townspeople, generously assuring the city's leaders that their property would be respected. He even gave them the option of leaving the city with their movable property uh, if they wished to do so. So this is how the battle actually ended in, in the military phase. But now we come to the post-conflict phase of the battle. And we witness an extraordinary round of diplomacy in which Ismail Adil Khan and Krishnaraya engaged in a sort of choreographed ballet in which we see the more human side with vivid clarity. Upon returning from Raichur to Vijayanagara, Krishnaraya devoted himself to several weeks of nonstop festival uh, and celebration, uh, in celebration of this crushing defeat of Ismail Adil Khan. And so he's back in Vijayanagara, uh, in the capital, uh, and here is a reconstruction of the Mahanavami uh, platform, uh, as it probably might have looked at in the day of Krishnaraya. Uh, and we see here 
you can still see them even today around the these bas relief at the base of that platform. Uh, the, these horses and elephants and uh, uh, and archers and uh, dancing men and women. Uh, uh, all of this kind of celebration uh, suggests the sort of carousing that would have taken place uh, in the capital of Vijayanagara after the king returned to the city, uh, having defeated Ismail Adha Khan at Raichur. Um, so when this was all over, the ambassador from the Sultan's court of Bijapur came down to Vijayanagara in order to negotiate a final settlement between the two kings. Uh, Krishna Raya clearly relished uh, this moment of triumph. First, he kept the ambassador waiting for a full month before even admitting him for a private audience. When he finally did get an audience with the king, the ambassador conveyed to the king an extraordinary request from Ismail Adha Khan. That was that the Sultan would remain the king's enduring and loyal friend forever if only Krishnaraya would restore to Ismail the city of Raichur, together with all the artillery, the tents, the horses, the elephants, the equipment, all everything that he lost in the battle. Now, considering that the Sultan had been thoroughly defeated, both on the battlefield and at the fort, this was a stunning request. Most diplomats would have been turned out of court altogether for making such an outrageous request. But Krishnaraya, basking in his triumph, decided to play the ambassador by agreeing to all the requests of his defeated adversary. Indeed, he went even further. He offered to return to the Sultan his highest ranking officer, Salabat Khan, who had been captured in the battle by the Krishna River and was now languishing in the Vijayanagara jail. But there's only one catch. To close the deal, Ismail Adha Khan would first have to come down to Vijayanagara and kiss the king's foot. When this proposal was conveyed to the Sultan, Ismail replied through his ambassador, and I'm quoting the Portuguese account here, that he was a full mind joyfully to do that which the king wished. Regrettably though, he said that it was not possible for him legally to enter the, another king's sovereign territory and therefore he would not be able to come down and kiss, kiss the king's foot. On hearing this, Krishnaraya graciously offered to accommodate the Sultan's concerns by, by meeting him at their common border at the fort of Mudgal, which was located directly between Bijapur and Vijayanagara. There on the border, the Sultan could kiss the king's foot. By this time, the king, but this time the king did not wait for a reply from the Sultan. Uh, in fact, he made an immediate pressure, preparation to proceed directly to Mudgal. Moreover, he would be accompanied by a formidable army, uh, doubtless in order to focus the mind of the Sultan. Ismail, of course, had no intention of coming down to Mudgal or of enduring the humiliation of kissing the king's foot. So he stalled and he prevaricated while his messengers notif notified Krishnaraya that the Sultan was at that moment on the way and he would reach Mudgal very soon. Now, when it became clear that Ismail was not going to present himself at the border, Krishnaraya opted for an alternative course of action, namely of bringing his foot directly to the Sultan uh, so that the latter could kiss his foot in his own domain, in fact, in his own palace in Bijapur without having to travel anywhere. So the king, Krishnaraya, and his army now entered the Sultan's territory, moved all the way up to the capital of Bijapur, which the Sultan, by the way, prudently vacated uh, before the king's arrival. With Ismail absent, Krishnaraya's men then proceeded to damage several of the city's prominent houses on the grounds that they needed firewood. 
When Ismail protested through his envoys, Krishnaraya replied that he had been unable to restrain his men from their destructive activities. Eventually, the king, that is Krishnaraya, satisfied that he had humiliated his adversary sufficiently, left Vijapur and returned to his own capital at Vijanagara. So, what should we make of this battle and this rather dramatic diplomatic aftermath? I think we can learn several things from it uh, from different perspectives. First, there is the personal level, where we have this extraordinary power play between two major leaders. This is the human drama in which many human flaws are on full display. Arrogance, coercion, loss of face, aggression, humiliation. Second, there is the ideological level where we have the old question of Hindu-Muslim relations and the stereotype of pre-colonial India as a place sunk in perpetual communal conflict. And then there's a third level of world history. Here we encounter the diffusion of gunpowder technology in the early 16th century and the fascinating question of how different societies around the world responded to the advent of this new technology. So taking first the personal level of the conflict, the story of Krishnaraya's overbearing behavior in the aftermath of the battle really stands at odds with this modern image today. Basically, modern scholarship tends to see Krishnaraya through the rose-tinted lenses as one to be admired and even revered as an ideal Indian monarch, heroic, virtuous, courageous, pious, and just. Some of these virtues are nicely captured in uh, modern bronze statues, such as this one that we can see today. And then of course, there's his name. The king is universally not known as Krishna Raya, but Krishna Deva Raya. Now to my knowledge, there is only one contemporary inscription that has this for his title. In fact, the, this inscription goes even further and reads Krishna Deva Maharaya. Significantly, significantly, the donor of this inscription was Alasani Pedana, or Pediraju, who was the most acclaimed Telugu poet of the day. He was also a boon companion of the great, uh, uh, and, and he was a great panegyrist and a promoter of Krishnaraya. So it would make sense that Pedana would have been inflating the king's titles in the way that he did. But all other contemporary documents written in, in the early 16th century, chronicles, uh, inscriptions, uh, poetry, uh, foreign accounts, all of them call him simply Krishna Raya. So it seems that the lofty title of Krishna Deva Raya became popular only in the 19th century at a time of the Indian national movement when nationalists were looking back into Indian history to find virtuous role models. And Krishna Raya clearly fit uh, the, the, uh, the role uh, as, a, as someone to be emulated and admired. But Krishna Raya's actual behavior, I have to say, did not live up to such retroactive repackaging. At least one modern historian has rejected totally the possibility that a man as noble-hearted as Krishna Raya could have demanded that any adversary had to kiss his foot. But consider the evidence. The reporter of this episode, the Portuguese trader Nunes, was an outsider with no particular stake in either side of the conflict. Nunes is not known to have met the king himself, although as a horse merchant living in metropolitan Vijayanagara for three years, uh, he would certainly have been in touch with the kingdom's uh, the, uh, the commercial agents. My own view is that Nunez's account of the foot episode is entirely factual and that it pr provides us with a much needed corrective to the idealized cardboard cutout image of the king that we find in most textbooks. If we look at contemporary art, it is clear that Krishnaraya wanted to be seen as a pious devotee of Lord uh, Venkateshvara, 
as is seen in this image of himself uh, at, with his queens uh, at that deity's temple at Tirupati. But if we shift the scene from Tirupati to Raichur, which the king had managed to seize from his arch enemy, the Sultan of Bijapur, we see a very different image. Here, the body language clearly projects an aura of arrogance and not an aura of humility. Moreover, it makes sense that the king would patronize this particular image at this particular site, right uh, at the gateway as you, uh, in the courtyard, uh, which the king himself built, by the way, after the battle. Because Raichur had been such a huge bone of contention between Krishnaraya and Ismail Adha Shah. In other words, the visual image of the king's personality, this particular image, would seem to be consistent with his arrogant demand that an adversary should kiss his foot. But there's another side to the story. That is, that during this campaign against the Sultan of Bijapur, Krishnaraya had in his service a man who would later display the same high-handed style of, of diplomacy, which in his case led to the destruction of metropolitan Vijayanagara and ultimately the collapse of the state. This was Ramaraya, an officer who had joined Krishnaraya's service five years before the battle at Raichur, and a man who so impressed Krishnaraya that the king gave him his own daughter in marriage. After the king's death in 1529, Ramaraya suddenly rose in power. In 1542, becoming Vijayanagara's supreme autocrat, uh, although if, if not his legal, the legal king. For several decades, Ramaraya intervened in, in conflicts uh, among the sultanates of the north, uh, and by his manipulative and haughty manner, uh, he finally induced all those sultanates in 1565 to set aside their differences and to combine forces in order to crush him at the famous Battle of Talakota. Significantly, the cause of that battle lay in an act that in its brazen audacity precisely echoed that of Krishnaraya and his foot. In 1561, Ramaraya demanded that if the Nizam Shah Sultan of Ahmednagar wanted lasting peace with Vijayanagara, he must first come down and eat betel nut from his hand. Unlike Ismail of Bijapur, who preferred to abandon his capital rather than suffer the humiliation of kissing the, the foot of, uh, of Krishnaraya, the Sultan of Ahmednagar swallowed his pride and accepted the humiliation that was imposed on him by Ramaraya, and he ate the beetle from his hand, the pond. But shortly afterward, he mobilized other sultans of the Deccan to combine forces and wage a campaign in which Ramaraya was killed, his army was destroyed, and Vijayanagara itself was demolished. And here you see a contemporary painting of Ramaraya being beheaded. Uh, this, of course, was the famous Battle of Talakota, took place in 1565. Now, I strongly suspect that Ramaraya's habit of humbling and humiliating his northern adversaries was something that he had picked up by observing the overbearing diplomacy of his own father-in-law, Krishnaraya. A second level of analyzing these events is that of Hindu-Muslim relations. Now, the image of destructive Muslim rulers violating Hindu sacred space by demolishing temples, as we all know, is deeply etched in the collective consciousness of millions of Indians today, thanks in large part to British historiography. Although the Battle of Raichur is virtually unknown in Indian history, uh, the Battle of Talakota has, in conventional historiography, swollen into the, a titanic confrontation between Muslims and Hindus. Moreover, in this historiography, the defeat of Ramaraya at Talakota led not only to the destruction of the kingdom, but to the snuffing out of India's last independent Hindu ruler for over a century. However, 
it would seem that the critical factor that preoccupied, that, pre, that precipitated, that, that inaugurated or began the Battle of Talakota was not endemic Hindu-Muslim hostility. In fact, religion appears to have had nothing to do with that battle. What precipitated the Battle of Talakota was the Battle of Raichur, the earlier battle, and more particularly, the legacy of overbearing arrogance that had characterized that battle's aftermath, as reflected in Krishnaraya's insistence that the vanquished Sultan kiss the foot of the victor. In other words, what we see here is not religious conflict, but old-fashioned power politics. Finally, we need to see this battle through the lens of world history, and I'll close with this insight, and specifically by asking how it was that new technologies moved across space and by what mechanisms they moved and how were they assimilated in societies where they had previously been unknown. So this is really a story of technological diffusion. Just as Bangalore and Hyderabad are today the center of the diffusion of global technologies, te textiles and software, in the 16th century, the Deccan also had been the center of another kind of diffusion, technology diffusion. In the decades before 1510, foreigners identified with the surname Rumi, meaning Ottoman Turk, went out to India when the Ottoman Navy engaged the Portuguese Navy off the Indian coast. But instead of returning home, some of them took up service with the Bijapur sultans and developed Goa, then under Bijapur's control, as the major center of gun manufacturing in Asia. Then in 1510, the Portuguese captured Goa from control of Bijapur, and for the next 10 years, they brought to India German techniques of gunsmithing that now merged with techniques that had already been introduced by Turkish gunsmiths. So we have local gunsmiths developing these hybrid matchlocks that were superior to those made anywhere else in the world. Goa thus witnessed the creative fusion of two different traditions of gun making, the Ottoman and the German. In the 16th century, even while the Ottomans and the Austrians were fighting each other in Europe, in Goa, far from the arena of Austrian-Ottoman struggle, gunsmithing, those two, uh, the gunsmithing traditions of those two antagonists were fusing and creating something that was superior to either one of their predecessors in Europe. Then in 1520, we get the decisive Battle of Raichur, in which Krishnaraya soundly uh, defeated Bijapur, <coughs> both in the pitched battle by the river and at the fort of Raichur. This presents us with a kind of paradox. Since the side that relied most extensively on firearms not only lost the battle, but lost decisively. Just six years after the Battle of Raichur in 1526, one of India's most famous battles in, um, was fought at Panipat, far up in North India, a thousand miles away. In that contest, Babur not only de defeated the last ruler of the Delhi Sultanate, but he went on to establish the mightiest empire in India's history, the Mughals. But because he used field cannon in that contest, and because his victory at Panipat was immediately followed by the establishment of the Mughal Empire, Panipat is sometimes seen as having inaugurated the, in, the gunpowder age of India. This obviously is not true. That age was actually begun six years earlier at Raichur. I suspect that the reason people know so little about Raichur battle is precisely because the side that, pos that did possess gunpowder was the same side that lost the battle. Whereas uh, one would think that the side that possessed gunpowder should logically have won the battle. Since the battle's outcome is therefore counterintuitive, historians have simply swept this battle under the rug and ignored it. The actual lesson of that battle, however, is to me that states and societies assimilate new technologies by a gradual process of trial and error, 
in respect of which failure can be as important as success. This is the real importance of Battle of Raichur from a standpoint of world history. Ismail lost the battle by the river, mainly because his gunners could not reload and fire successive rounds of shot quickly enough before being overwhelmed by Vijayanagara's swift and powerful cavalry. The problem was not technical, uh, it was also tactical. The Sultan's decision to fire all 900 cannon at one time in one mighty blast allowed his surviving opponents the opportunity to counterattack and overwhelm his entire army. So much had to be learned about the manufacture, but also the deployment of field cannon. Considerable practice would be necessary before this new technology could really be lethal to its opponents. So from this standpoint, the defeat of Ismail represented a crucial step toward the full integration of field cannon into South Asia's military tradition, uh, the tradition of heavy cavalry that Nerdabur had dominated uh, hundreds of years of, of, of warfare. Similar lessons had to be learned from the, the defensive use of cannons, not just the offensive use, it's the defensive cannon. And here too, Ismail had been innovative. Uh, he seems to have been the first ruler in India to mount cannon on the battlements of his fort at Raichur. And at the onset of the battle, uh, he had 200 heavy cannon along the curtain walls and, and also uh, uh, 30 bastions had cannon uh, where the cannon was basically replacing the old stone hurling catapult, which had been an ancient device used since Roman days. You know, you have these large slingshots that are hurling stones. Well, what Ismail did very innovatively was to, was to use these large cannon, replacing the, the catapults on the, on the bastions. However, Ismail's deployment of his cannon in this manner proved to be disastrous for, uh, for defending the fort. Being placed high on the curtain walls in fixed positions, they could not fire down upon these, the men of Krishnaraya as they were walking up with their pickaxes uh, and, their, and their crowbars with which they dismantled the fort stone by stone. Uh, you see here uh, the kind of fixed cannon. Uh, this is not the, the Battle of Raichur, this is actually a North Indian Mughal painting, uh, but you see how the cannon is not able to move up or down, nor can it be moved side by side. Uh, it is sitting on these wheels, more or less fixed. It cannot be moved. You cannot maneuver this cannon up and down. So if somebody is approaching the fort from below, uh, you are not able to maneuver the cannon in such a way as to defend it. Uh, so this miniature gives us, I think, a good example of what we see uh, in, 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 in Raichur. The engineers, uh, uh, Bijapur's engineers in Raichur, had not yet learned how to mount and maneuver the cannon so as to screen the walls with flanking fire. In fact, here we see the walls of Raichur, and the, the arrows are pointing to these square ports. And if you look from the inside of the fort outward, you can see that this is where they would have uh, put those large cannon. And the cannon obviously is not able to move. It cannot move up or down or from right to left. Uh, being fixed uh, uh, along the, the battlements here, instead of mounted on swivel, uh, the cannon would have been basically useless against besiegers who are directly below. However, in the 30 years between the Battle of Raichur and Talakota, Bijapur aggressively experimented with new techniques to build and operate cannon so as to make them more effective than they had been before. Here, for example, uh, is a, an Ottoman cannon that uh, I discovered in one of the forts in, uh, in, in the Deccan and Aosa. And you see here the trunnions. These are these, these projections on the right and left side of the cannon, which allow the cannon to move up and down. 
And that is critical because this enables, obviously, the cannon to be maneuvered uh, in a much more effective way than was the case when it's simply locked in there uh, on its wheels. Then from the Portuguese, uh, Bijapur engineers assimilated the idea of the swivel. So you see here on this picture of an early Portuguese, very small cannon. They would use these cannons, by the way, uh, along the gunnels of their ships. These were not large. They were only about one meter long. Uh, but the important thing is they had a, a mechanism which allowed the, the gun to move not only up and down, but also from side to side, from right to left, as because the whole gun is now swiveling. So what the engineers in Bijapur did, and this was a dramatically important technological breakthrough, what they did is they took the idea of, the Ottoman idea of, of these uh, trunnions, together with the Portuguese idea of swivel cannon, and combined them on these huge cannon that are sometimes four or five, six feet or meters long, and mounted these cannon on the tops of hills. So what you're seeing here uh, is a very large wrought iron cannon uh, with very crude trunnions at the base in the middle. And those trunnions are placed on a large block it, it, that, that, is, that itself swivels around uh, a, uh, the, the mount. So here, actually that's me. <laughs> I'm crawling down underneath the mount, and I'm going to photograph here uh, an iron peg on which the, the mounting block uh, is connected to the surface of the platform. In other words, the iron peg is the pivot on which the whole block, and therefore the cannon, can move from right to left. Now, this is a very crude mechanism, uh, I, I, I assure you, but from a technological standpoint, it is revolutionary because it meant that now uh, the use of cannon will be much more effective. Uh, this is one of the lessons that was learned from the Battle of Raichur. Very quickly, the engineers in Bijapur uh, made more efficient use than the one you saw a moment ago. Only five or 10 years after that earlier gun, they're now making cast bronze cannons and putting them on these large swivels. And as you can see, uh, these can be moved not only up and down, but also from right to left and therefore are much more efficient. So they're beginning to mount these cannons now on, on all their hill forts in the kingdom. Uh, here at Yadgir, uh, these, these cannons, I've actually been able to date them. These were all manufactured in the 1550s and they're positioned at the tops of, of these forts. Uh, and they could be used to swivel around. They're also uh, upgrading the bastions themselves. You see here at the Fort of Kalyana in Northern Karnataka, the old 15th century wall on the right, and then this large 16th century bastions that is built projecting outward. And in the middle of that bastion is a cavalier. That cavalier is intended to house one of these uh, large cannons which can be maneuvered around. In fact, if you look very carefully, you can see in the middle of this image, in the middle of the cavalier, the muzzle of the cannon itself kind of poking out uh, to the right. Um, so to conclude this morning, what can we learn? Uh, what was the effect of the victory uh, at Raichur? Um, uh, for the military te technology at Vijayanagara. Well, for Krishna Raya, who won the battle, his victory confirmed for him the value of heavy cavalry on the field and also the use of infantry armed with nothing but pickaxes during the siege of the fort. In other words, the king of Vijayanagara could hardly be faulted for not seeing cannon warfare as the wave of the future. After all, he won the battle, and he won the battle with horses and pickaxes. He did not use firearms. Indeed, clear down to the final destruction of his kingdom in 1565, the walls of Vijayanagara itself, together with all the other forts 
in the, in the Southern Deccan, remained without bastions, without gun mounts, and without cannon. And you can see in this image of one of the walls at Regional Nagar itself, it's very crude. Uh, uh, you see no evidence of mortar, uh, which are cementing these stones together. Uh, we see no evidence of cannon uh, or the kind of bastions that might support these, this cannon. By contrast, up in, in, uh, in Bijapur, the successors to Ismail, uh, although they had lost the battle at Raichur, they kept on experimenting with elaborate battlements and experimenting with different kind, ways of mounting cannon, first on the curtain walls, then on bastions, and finally on these swivel mount uh, systems that were integrated into the bastions uh, on these cavaliers. Uh, which would replace the old stone hurling catapult. So this is far more efficient, more, far more effective than what was seen before. They also built, uh, if they didn't happen to have a mountain or hill uh, handy, they would build these huge cavaliers like the one you see here at Naldurg, uh, which would imitate a hill where they could gain the advantage of height. So you walk up these stairways you see here, you get to the very top and you see uh, these two large swivel cannons that are mounted at the top of this thing as if it were a hill. In, in this way, they could control the entire countryside. Uh, these kinds of introductions and innovations, I would argue, were revolutionary not only in India, but all over the world. Uh, and this was happening very rapidly in the 1550s and 1560s, uh, <clears throat> before the Battle of Talakota. Uh, the engineers in Bijapur, I suggest, were far ahead of anybody else, not only in India, but in the world. Even 200 years later, the French in North America were using the same kind of fixed immobile cannon uh, here at the Fort Ticonderoga, Ticonderoga in northern New upstate New York. Uh, 1755. This is the same kind of thing that we saw in Bijapur, uh, or Raichur, uh, 200 years earlier, 250 years earlier. Uh, in fact, as late as the mid-19th century, uh, the Americans in Fort Sumter in South Carolina uh, were using cannon in much the sim similar way, with limited mobility, as you can see here, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in 1860. So in this way, to conclude all of this this morning, uh, we have then a story that would otherwise seem to be particular to the, United, to, the, to the history of India, a somewhat unremarkable story of two rival kings struggling over control of, of Raichur in the middle of the Deccan Plateau. Uh, this, this story, in fact, merges with themes that have enormous worldwide significance, which is to say the military revolution uh, that is worldwide. And with that, I will close this talk and I uh, look forward to your questions or comments uh, that, that you may have for me. I want to, again, thank you very much for this opportunity to present this discussion of the Battle of Raichur as I've tried to look from both the standpoint of diplomacy and the standpoint of technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Richard Eaton for a uh, lucid session, uh, which reopened a new chapter and insights in the history of uh, um, Raichur battle. Um, I think it's a new transition in the chapter of uh, Raichur battle historiography too. Uh, now we are taking a few questions from the uh, audience. Uh, first questions, first question for you yes. from uh, Professor Paniraj uh, K from Udupi. Did this humiliation carried to battle of Rakkasatangadi.
in the in the battle of raichur uh yes exactly i would suggest that um there is a there's a great similarity in between the battle of raichur and and the so-called battle of talakota we know that it was not fought in talakota it, you're correct it was fought south of the river krishna uh but it's only named talakota because that was where the 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 five armies of the north uh came together they then crossed the river where they defeated the army of ramaraya and yes i would suggest that the humiliation that was suffered by um that was inflicted on on ismail adha khan by krishna raya uh finds an exact parallel in the kind of humiliation that was inflicted on the northern sultans preceding the battle of talakota in fact that's the cause of talakota uh that uh, hossein nizam shah of amnagar was made to come to the tent of ramaraya and and accept uh pan from his hand and we know that he was humiliated because we have a a contemporary persian account uh describing that uh that under his breath uh the sultan uh swore uh, uh, re- uh vengeance uh, revenge uh on ramaraya so there's no doubt that ramaraya was behaving in a way in a very arrogant and humiliating way toward uh the sultan uh, hossein shah of ahmadnagar uh in the same way that krishna raya had done uh with respect to ismail adha khan uh demanding that he come down and kiss his foot i mean the, i see these as simply power plays uh that are have nothing to do with religion obviously but everything to do with publicly humiliating an adversary uh and it, it seems to me very clear that that was the principal uh factor that that caused all of these sultans of the northern deccan which before that point had been struggling against each other they fought in many many wars and struggles against each other now they all came together and said we have to overthrow ramaraya uh, we have to end this humiliation because he had humiliated not only uh, hossein shah uh of amnagar but also uh uh adil shah of of bijapur ali adil shah of bijapur and ibrahim maqdub shah of golconda uh they all had suffered some kind of humiliation at the hands of ramaraya so that yes i absolutely i i think there's a direct connection between these two battles in that question from uh, question from uh, dr sp wagishwari from christ university bangalore Uh, professor what was the strain on vijayanagar economy since they had to appropriate buying using gunfire in addition to employing the european personnel personnel to use them yeah it's an interesting question the strain on on the vijayanagar economy um well i would suggest that the vijayanagar economy is a very interesting question because you know vijayanagar had always presented a certain paradox uh the capital was located up on the the center of a very dry deccan plateau but most of the wealth that was coming to vijayanagar was coming from the coast coastal areas um especially east coast the tamil country uh where all these weaving centers were uh it, providing tr- tremendous shot in the arm to the economy um uh of the of the plateau plus of course we know from archaeological research that uh vijayanagar had been expanding the system of canals and and uh and um and 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 and, and, and uh, buns tank buns in order to improve the economy the agricultural economy of the north uh and so you have a very delicate system whereby the economy is sustained mainly by agriculture that is that is perfected by uh dry farming uh with an elaborate system of tank buns uh, which the vijayanagar kings promoted very successfully 
and this weaving industry of the Tamil coast, uh, which, which brought tremendous wealth to the kings of Vijayanagara. And then you have the conquests of, of Krishnamaya himself. Uh, when he conquered the southern peninsula and Orissa, uh, a lot more wealth is coming into the, to, to the country. So all of this is fundamental, it seems to me, uh, that enabled the kingdom to uh, support huge armies. Uh, the army of Vijayanagara was larger than any single army of the northern Deccan. Uh, Bijapur, Golconda, Bidar, Ahmednagar, uh, these sultanates were never able to field as many men as uh, the Vijayanagara army could, which is what, what gave Ramaraya the advantage, obviously. He was able to use his, his larger army <coughs> um, as a threat against any one of these individual sultanates. Um, the, the weakness of Vijayanagara, it seems to me, uh, was not economic, uh, it was military. Because Krishnaraya won the Battle of Raichur without cannon, Krishnaraya and his successors, Achyutaraya and then Ramaraya, they saw no need to experiment with, with cannon technology. No need. We already have powerful cavalry. We already have a huge infantry. Why do we need cannon? So you saw the image uh, of these walls, uh, which have no, no evidence, no sign of, of, of any experimentation with military technology. Uh, and they, as a result, they fell way behind uh, the Northern Deccan, which had built these far superior uh, defensive systems and offensive systems, uh, which is ultimately the reason that Vigilagra uh, uh, was defeated. Thank you for that. Uh, a question from Vikar Ahmad. Uh, he's uh, he's a very uh, sensible journalist from uh, the Hindu front line. He also worked on uh, Talikota battle very extensively. Yeah. His question is like this. The image of Krishna Devaraya that he was an ideal king comes from his behavior with his enemies. For example, in his encounter with the Gajapatis, we see a benevolent side of Krishna Devaraya. Yes. But after but after the battle of Raichur, we see a different side of the Vijayanagara king where he blazes through the territory of Bijapur, brazenly killing his enemies in a yes. cruel way. How do we interpret this change in his behavior, vice versa, his enemies? How can one and how can we discount the religious element completely in this radical change in Krishna Devaraya's attitude? Yes, I think that's a very good point, and I agree with you entirely uh, in this transformation of Krishnaraya's behavior. There is no doubt that, he, that I mean, I don't want to <laughs> damage or in any way undermine Krishnaraya's well-deserved reputation as a generous king. We know, for example, at Raichur, uh, when he defeated, when he took the fort, he immediately went inside and assured all the population that they would be uh, they would be spared, they could, they could preserve their property, <clears throat> they could remain if they wished, or they could leave with their property if they wished. Uh, and so I, 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 I have no doubt that he, that, he, that he intended to project that image, and he did project that image vis-a-vis -vis ordinary people. However, with respect to the king, uh, which is Ismail, uh, we have a very different side of his personality. And very clearly, uh, he intended to humiliate the king, not only by demanding that he kiss his foot, but also by, as you correctly point out, by invading the north, uh, occupying the, the capital of Bijapur itself, uh, allowing his men to, to run free uh, uh, and, and plunder the city. Uh, <clears throat> he also took the city of Golbarga on that same campaign uh, and he, uh, he, he, he issued an inscription in which he claimed to have reinstalled uh, the, uh, the, the Bahmani governor of Golbarga. Of course, there was no Bahmani empire uh, or sultanate even existing at the time. Uh, all of this was intended to show that he, Krishnaraya, was now the master of all the Deccan, not just the southern Deccan. So you, the question is, how do I account for the transformation of behavior? 
I account for it simply because uh, he he chose to humiliate the Sultan of, of Bijapur, not because of religious reasons that I, that I can see, but simply because he demanded that he that that he that that he be humiliated uh, to show who was the most powerful figure in the, the plateau. We're dealing with a, a style of kingship which transcends religion, uh, forcing someone to to eat pawn from his hand or to kiss his foot. To my mind, it is simply a, a way of of projecting power, uh, and nothing that I can see to do with any religion, but. Yeah, I think you are correct. There is a clear transformation of Krishnamaya's um, behavior before and after the Battle of Raichur. Raichur really transformed the king. Uh, he became a different sort of king. And I think the most dramatic example of that, or, uh, or evidence of that, is in the body language of uh, the bas-relief that I showed you uh, in Raichur itself where he's depicted seated on the throne uh, in, in a very arrogant way. Uh, uh, and, and that, I think, is the new kind of Krishnaraya that we see after Raichur, in, in, in contrast to the Krishnaraya that we see at Tirupati, which is where he's very pious. Uh, so th that's a, a fascinating story of the transformation of Krishnaraya's own character. Thank you for that question. Uh, Vikar Ahmad is um, adding some positive remarks as a compliment to you uh, that uh, to argue that the memory of the Battle of Raichur and the, and the common trope of uh, humiliation links the Battle of Raichur in 1520 and the Battle of Talikota, Talikota in 1565, 45 years later, needs more historical evidence, I think. I state this humbly, having learned everything about medieval Deccan history from your works. <laughs> well, I do not claim to have the last word, uh, I, and I very much look forward to your own conclusions in this matter. Uh, my argument is simply based on one man's uh, presence in both battles, and that is Ramaraya. Ramaraya, as a young man, was the son-in-law of Krishnamaya at the time of the Battle of Raichur. Uh, and he would have witnessed and known about and observed the behavior of his father-in-law. Uh, and from that moment on, uh, it, it didn't take long for Ramaraya to immediately begin to show the same kind of arrogant behavior uh, that Krishnaraya had shown in Raichur. So what we see is an arrogant uh, Ramaraya who is inflicting this kind of humiliating behavior on northern sultans all the way from, uh, as soon as he sees his power, uh, he, he's doing this. So I, for, for me, I see that a very clear connection between these two battles, and the connection is Ramaraya himself. But I do look forward to your own work, and, 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 and uh, which might indeed make me change my own mind in this. So thank you. Um. But uh, Professor Faniraj case uh, question uh, related to Vikaramat's question is that uh, can your answer to Vikar's query also be related to Tipu's act against British British alloys? Uh, Tipu Sultan. In other words, you, you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Um, can you repeat that, please. Yeah, can you answer to Vikar's query, or Vikar Ahmad's earlier question you have answered? Right. Uh, also be related to Tipu's act against British alloys. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <clears throat> well, I had, never, I had never considered that, but I would think that that is an interesting question that one should explore. I mean, it's clear that, that kings are always looking over their shoulder to look at what their predecessors had done and what their contemporaries are doing. And so one can find these echoes of behavior kind of bouncing across history. Uh, and you, and, and when you think of Tipu Sultan, 
<clears throat> and you think of the way that he quite deliberately was uh, trying to humiliate the British with this whole tiger uh, cult that he cultivated. Uh, yes, there is a certain connection between, between uh, Krishna Raya, Rama Raya, and Tipa Sultan uh, that would be fascinating to explore in more detail. Uh, and perhaps you might take that up as a, as a, <laughs> as a source of inquiry. Thank you for that suggestion. Uh, Dr. S. K. Roni asks, Sir, what was kissing the feet or namaskar to foot? Because there seems to be no such kissing feet tradition in the indigenous ritual. It is an Islamic tradition, kissing hand to the elders and respected. Yes, I, that is exactly true. Uh, the Persian word for that is, is, is pa busi. Kissing foot and is always seen as a, as a, a sign of, of, of respect. Um, that's a very interesting point because we're now we're, we're looking at the kind of cultural meaning uh, of this these kinds of gestures, which I think need to be more closely examined. Uh, uh, and, and indeed, the whole idea of of, of a salam using a hand, your right hand like this, uh, is a, a shorthand version of, of, of putting your hand all the way to the ground, uh, where you're, in a sense, symbolically equating one's face with the earth. Uh, and the earth is where, which is, which is defiled by feet. Um, and so this tradition of pa busi, of, 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 of kissing foot, uh, has a ancient tradition in Persian, I would not say Islamic, but, but certainly in Persian uh, style of, of, uh, of culture, which is conveyed obviously from, from Iran and from Central Asia into India. And we see this in, in paintings, we, we see, we find references to it in literature. Uh, so it is well known in Persian discourse, uh, Pabusi as a sign of respect. Krishna Raya, when he is demanding that Ismail kiss his foot, is reversing that uh, clearly in a way that undermines the, the uh, and obviously, you know, it, it's, having been defeated at the battle, uh, there's no way that Ismail Aga Khan can interpret this, this uh, this ceremony as one of, 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 of respect uh, to, to the victor, Krishnaraya. So Krishnaraya clearly, to my mind, understands the Persian symbolism, even though he's not himself, obviously a Muslim, it doesn't matter. He understands the symbolism of the Persian tradition of Pabusi, which again, has nothing to do with religion at all. And he's, he's turning it around. He's turning against Ismail Khan. And so I find this a fascinating example of how uh, one ruler has taken the, the symbolic kind of ritual of, of another, of his adversary, and turned it against him. And it becomes even more powerful uh, because this is obviously not part of, of Krishna Raya's own inherited tradition. There was no tradition of Papusi uh, among the uh, um, um, among, among Hindus of South India. Um, and that is what makes it even more humiliating. There's no way that, uh, that, that Ismail Khan could suffer that and endure that kind of humiliation. Indeed, he had to abandon, abandon his capital. He left his capital altogether and allowed Krishnaraya to come and occupy the, the, the Gagan Mahal, the, 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 uh, the, the royal palace in Bijapur. So, to me, this tradition of the, the, the incident of, 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 uh, of you know, of Pabusi, of kissing the foot here, is a, a dramatic example of how a ritual has been taken from one's opponent and turned against him in a, a publicly humiliating way. Thank you for that. This question, uh, there is one question, 
with no name uh, what was the nature of relationship between political power and religion then if it was not a hindu muslim conflict can we think of empire expansion without religious intervention well that's certainly true in the deccan uh, <clears throat> remember that before talakota for 30 years, 30, 40 years, you have all these so-called Muslim sultanates are fighting each other, deadly wars. <clears throat> um, and they are occasionally uh, uh, being assisted by Vijayanagara to the south, when Ramaraya is assisting one, sometimes he's allied himself with Gulbarga, next time he's allied himself with, with Bidar, next time he might ally himself with Bijapur or Amannagar. Uh, and what's interesting is it's impossible to find any religious connection or make sense between these, these, these various wars based on religion. Uh, they're based on territory. They're based on the control of forts. Uh, the book that I wrote with my colleague, uh, Philip Wagner, it tries to look at Deccani history through the perspective of conflict being basically a, a matter of uh, the uh, primary centers and the secondary centers. The primary centers being the capitals of Vijayanagara, of Golconda, Bijapur, Apanagar, and the secondary centers being these smaller forts like Aosa, uh, Kalyana, uh, or Raichur itself. And so basically, the conflict that one, fly, one does find in the Deccan Plateau is not some mighty conflict between two religions, but it's perpetual conflict over control of forts. Why? Because if you control a fort, that means you control the surrounding countryside, which is supplying grain uh, to that fort. Uh, you also, of course, control uh, the, the, the ability to, to house cavalry and therefore expand your, project your military power. So it seems to me that this whole discussion of religion, uh, when, we, when we are trying to understand the dynamics of history in, in 16th, 15th, 16th, and 17th century Deccan Plateau, uh, it is the, you're absolutely, it has no sense to look at religion at all. Uh, we, we, it, it's, it's simply a question of power politics and the dynamics of who is controlling which forts. And these forts are constantly changing hands. Uh, Raichur especially. Raichur was on the border, you remember, between Bijapur and Vijayanagara. And Raichur was also in the heart of this very rich doab uh, that was very productive. And therefore, that was one more reason why Raichur and Mudgal uh, were, were constantly contested in that area. So thank you for that question too. A uh, uh, question from Francis Daudi, uh, University of Basel, Switzerland. Uh, he's asking, did you consult Krishna Devaraya Dinachari or diary? Because I think this is important source to understand Krishna Devaraya's attitude, particularly on wars and diplomacy. He wrote uh -huh. this personal diary in Canada by Francis Dowdy, University of Basel, Switzerland. Right. Um, I have not seen that diary, and uh, I would be very interested to know more about what uh, Krishnaraya in that diary might have said that would throw any light on these two battles. Um, so I would look forward to, to hearing more about that. Please, I would be happy to... Uh, you can send me anything uh, that you may discover. Uh, the, uh, I, I, mean, I know that there have been studies of, of Krishna Raya's uh, poems uh, and some effort to understand his personality through that, and, and they have been very revealing. But to my knowledge, that, those discussions have not really shown anything by way of, uh, that would reflect his understanding of these two battles. That said, I am always open for more information, so I would appreciate uh, if you would wish to contact me, I would send me anything you might discover about uh, what his diary 
may tell us about his uh, his personality with respect to these battles. So thank you for that. Vikar Ahmad asking another question. You have argued in the past that part of the reason for Ramaraya's intervention in the affairs of the Deccan Sultanates was to control the Sultanate, Sultanate that controlled Kalyana. Considering that Vijayanagara was the paramount power, paramount power of southern India, why didn't Ramaraya ever try to bring Kalyana into his domain directly? Yes. Well, I think that the answer to that, or that's a fascinating question. Uh, there, there seems to be no doubt that Ramaraya uh, wished to legitimize and justify his seizure of power by associating himself with the earlier Chalukya dynasty. Um, we know this because there are inscriptions and there are genealogies uh, that are contemporary with him, written uh, by the Aravidu uh, family uh, that uh, refer to Ramaraya with titles such as the, you know, Chalukya Chakravarti, uh, or, or the, the, the king who conquered Kalyana. Uh, Kalyana, of course, being the capital of the Chalukyas. Um, and so there's this interesting identification uh, between Ramaraya and this earlier empire, the Chalukyas. Um, and when I studied the, the pattern of alliances that Ramaraya engaged in vis-a-vis -vis these northern sultanates. In every case, the sultanate with whom he allied himself was that sultanate that controlled Kalyana, or was trying to control Kalyana. And I believe that in this way, Ramaraya was trying to position himself as the, um, as the, as the, the super Raya, the, the over king of, of, of Kalyana, in the sense that he was trying to make the Sultan a vassal of his. By helping the, by helping the Sultan, Ramaraya was able to position himself as the, the king over that Sultan, uh, so that the Sultan becomes a vassal of Ramaraya. And so in this way, Ramaraya can kind of indirectly understand or see himself and project himself as the Chakravarti uh, or the, the Maharaja of, the, uh, of, of Kalyana, and in this way, make good his claim to be a Chalukya emperor. So there's a very interesting dynamic here. To me, it is Ramaraya's obsession with, um, with, with, with the Chalukyas and his own insecurity. I mean, remember, he, he's, not, he's not a legal king, you know. <laughs> the the Tulavas are the, are the technically the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the ruling dynasty. And he's got this Tulava emperor uh, who he's not allowing even to, to appear but more than once every year uh, in court in Vijayanagara. So Ramaraya is in a very kind of shaky position uh, and insecure. And so he needs to project himself uh, as something more than what he really is, which is, in fact, a, a relatively minor chieftain uh, of, of an important lineage, to be sure, the Aravidu. But nonetheless, uh, he's not legitimate as a, as a tool of a king. And so uh, his claim to control Kalyana is, is, is a real thing. Uh, he, he can do it symbolically through his titles, but he needs to do it uh, politically by making sure that whoever controls Kalyana is his vassal. In that way, he can demonstrate that he is indeed the, 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 uh, the, 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 the true overking or Maharaja uh, of, of, of Kalyana. That's my, that's my interpretation. Thank you very much for that. Question from uh... Paniraj K, is there any reason that Krishna Raya did not learn military technology, did not learn from his mercenaries? <laughs> That's a good question. 
why did he not learn from his mercenaries? Uh, we have no evidence that there was ever a arsenal or a munitions uh, factory set up in Vijayanagara itself. Um, he simply relied on these Portuguese mercenaries, uh, but we have no evidence that he developed his own uh, infantry that was armed with, with, with these kinds of weapons. Um, my interpretation is that he was so supremely victorious at Raichur uh, that he simply did not see any point in pursuing firearms apart from, I mean, he would supplement his army, obviously, with these Portuguese foreigners uh, as mercenaries, but he did not, he did not see the point of, uh, of developing his own system. That was a fatal flaw. Uh, had Krishna Raya understood the true meaning of Raichur, uh, and had he understood the, the potential of canon, uh, then history might have been very, very different. And it certainly would have been different. Um, had he not been so arrogant, uh, that was another problem. Uh, so there's, there's really two sides. There's his own arrogance, and there's his own failure to see gunpowder technology as the wave of the future. Uh, my own answer, and I, I, I don't claim it to be the final answer, of course, there's never a final answer to anything in history, but my own answer tentatively is that his victory was so overwhelming, he crushed Ismail Adil Khan, both by the Krishna River and at Raichur Fort. And it was so decisive and so thorough uh, that he simply concluded uh, that he's got enough. He has enough with his huge army, his powerful cavalry, and uh, assisted by uh, a few uh, mercenaries. He only had, there were only 20 mercenaries, Portuguese, with him at Raichur. So he did not have a big, a large number of mercenaries uh, with him. So thank you for that question. Professor S. K. Aruni says, uh, Herman Goiz mentions that the fall of Vijayanagara brought nationalization of art in Vijayanagara, especially in South India. Please give your comments on that statement. I think that, I think Goetz is right. I, I, I agree. Uh, there's, uh, I would not use the word nationalization. I would simply use diffusion uh, of art. Um, I mean, clearly, when Vijayanagara lost the Battle of Talakota, and the city itself was abandoned. You have all these thousands of artists and artisans and stone builders, stone makers and architects. They need employment. And where are they gonna go? Well, they're gonna go north uh, and find employment with the Sultans of, 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 of Bijapur. Uh, and so it is, it is no coincidence it's no coincidence that the architecture at Bijapur uh, begins to take on many of the features of Vijayanagara after Talakota. Uh, Hermann Goetz, although he's a very, very old scholar, it goes back to the 1920s and 30s, I think. Uh, I think he was onto something because he was looking at the Deccan as a, as a total uh, unified plateau and not as a region that was carved in half by the Krishna River. Uh, between north and south. So I, I, I would agree entirely with, with Hermann Goetz in, in looking at the artistic and the architectural history uh, of all this. By the way, there are a number of art historians who have picked up on, on Hermann Goetz's work. Uh, I have in mind uh, not only George Michel, uh, but also Helen Phelan. Uh, her work and her ongoing research is, is, is showing these these continuing influences between the Northern Deccan and the Southern Deccan, uh, so that art history, I think, is a very useful tool in understanding the larger cultural, uh, the, 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 the Deccan as a total totality, uh, as a single unified cultural space. We see that very clearly illustrated in architecture and art. Thank you. Uh, that is again another question from Vikar Ahmed. Uh, uh, how do you, as a historian, treat 
sources like farishta and other muslim sources who often mention islamic zeal and jihad and words like infidels to describe enemies how do we discount religion when we use these sources right that's a very good question uh, it's a very old question but it's, it's still valid uh, there's no doubt that not only farishta but a tradition of Persian uh, history writing that goes all the way back uh, to Utbi in the, you know, in the 11th and 12th century uh, with the coming of the Gurids to North India. Uh, the, 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 the understanding of, of these two sides, the Muslims and the Kafirs, uh, this is something that is carried to India by uh, Turks, known as Turushkas in, in Sanskrit. Um, and this understanding of a, of a sharp dichotomy between the, the, the Muslims and the non-Muslims is something that is brought to India uh, immediately in the wake of the Mongol invasions of Central Asia. Uh, you must remember that the, the Delhi Sultanate was largely uh, supported uh, by and, and, and chronicled by historians who had fled the Mongols. And, and sought refuge in Delhi uh, under the, uh, the, uh, the Khiljis and the Tughluqs, and before that, the Mamluk uh, slave kings. So we have a continual migration of these people who came to India seeing the world in a very kind of bipolar manner between Muslims and infidels. The infidels, of course, to them were the Mongols, uh, the Mongols were not Muslim either, obviously. And these historians, when they come to India, they carry with them this mentality of a world that's divided between Muslims and infidels. So, but, it, but in India, the infidels obviously are going to be uh, the non-Muslims. Uh, but this idea of, of, of tension and conflict is something that is, it, it is inherited from the earlier Mongol tradition. Uh, it's very similar as a fascinating analog. When the Portuguese come to India in 1498 with Vasco da Gama, he comes to India with an image of the world divided between two communities, Christians and Muslims. This time, of course, the Christians are the good guys and the Muslims are the enemies. So when he reaches Calicut, he immediately sees Hindus and he thinks they're all Christians. Which is why when he, when he comes ashore, he gets off his ship and he's there to see the Zamoran of Calicut. Uh, on his way to the, to the palace of the Zamoran, he sees a goddess temple, uh, some kind of Devi temple, and he immediately thinks it's a goddess to the Virgin Mary, the Christian deity. And so he gets off his palanquin and he worships uh, at this temple thinking it's that. So there's a fascinating parallel between the early encounter of Turks in coming to, and Persians coming to India and the, and the coming to Portuguese. Uh, because what you see is what you've been trained to see in the past. Now, when we come to Talakota, by this time, there's already been three or 400 years of history writing uh, on the part of Persian writers who continue to use the trope of Muslim and Kafir. Uh, this is something that has been inherited. Uh, it, it makes a certain deal of sense uh, in the sense that the, they're obviously, the, many of these adversaries were correctly understood as non-Muslims, which is simply what Kafir means. Um, but they were not necessarily demonized as such. That's the critical point. Uh, they, they were simply the, the, the enemies that you're facing. Uh, and this, I think that's a very important point because it takes us back to the question of why were these wars ultimately fought? Why was it so easy for Muslim soldiers to be integrated into the army of Vijayanagara? Don't forget uh, that uh, Devaraja, I believe it was Devaraja I of Vijayanagara, uh, incorporated some 10,000 Muslim cavalrymen into his army, built mosques in the heart of Vijayanagara. Uh, there's a whole quarter of the city 
uh, for them. Uh, obviously, Islam was not an issue at all. Uh, however, effective cavalry who knew how to fight, uh, that was the issue. And so we find uh, soldiers moving uh, from north to south constantly. Uh, it didn't matter whether they were Hindu or Muslim. Uh, there were large numbers of Hindus who fought in the Sultanates, we know that, and large numbers of Muslims who fought in the Vijayanagara, we know that too. Uh, Ramaraya himself was first employed not in Vijayanagara. His first patron was uh, the Sultan of Golconda. He lost his job only because he did not show proper behavior in the battlefield. Uh, and, and he was fired, basically. He was dismissed. And so that was why he took up his job in, with Krishnaraya, only because he had failed uh, in, the, in the Sultan to the north. I'm making a long answer here, and I apologize for that, but I simply wish to make the point uh, that, that when we look at the behavior of armies and the actual behavior of individual soldiers and nobles and cavalrymen in the Deccan, we do not see them paying any regard to religion. What really mattered was whether they or not they were able to fight effectively and whether or not they were loyal. Uh, that seems to have been the, the decisive question in every case. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor for uh, the uh, uh, enlightening uh, you know, uh, session. Uh, almost questions are over and uh, there, there, there is a lot of uh, appreciations and uh, critical remarks, uh, remarks on your lecture. Uh, but I think um, uh, one 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 remark I have to you know convey you that you know he's saying one person is saying we have to mutually give claps in the end, but before that formally I express my uh, thanks to you, uh, as, and uh, I also express uh, my uh, sincere thanks on behalf of uh, Bangalore Historian Society, Itihasa Darpana, and. Uh, uh, rutumana.com the three four forums which organized this session and uh, we are uh, heartily express our uh, you know thanks to you and uh, it is also uh, you know there is a suggestion from uh, dr sk aruni uh, that um, whenever it is possible uh, please you know try to make a schedule uh, to ichr and uh, please uh, <laughs> deliver a uh, you know, thoughtful session on this and even Sufis also, he's, uh, he's asking that. Uh, I think again and again, uh, on behalf of three forums and the audience, I'm expressing my heartiest thanks to Professor Eaton Saab. Thank well, you thank very you. much. I, I just want to close by expressing my own uh, thank you to you for arranging this, 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 this talk and this very fascinating discussion that we had after it. Uh, and I want to remind, I would like to assure you that I do intend to return to Bangalore. And when I do, I will certainly stay at the Chalukya Hotel. I have very close connection with the Chalukya dynasty. <laughs> and I, will, I would very much look forward to the opportunity to addressing uh, the, your own organization uh, in Bangalore and indeed anywhere else in the Deccan Plateau where I can possibly go. So thank you once again. I, been a yeah. great pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Eaton, for uh, making time and you know and giving for a detailed and enlightened uh, session or talk, which you know transcends the very conventional sort of history and history writing, and uh, that is uh, you know very much clinches with the chauvinism and uh, fundamentalism and religious bigotry sort of narrations, especially that is happening across uh, Karnatakan history or history of Karnataka. Uh, express once again my heartiest thanks and uh, you know uh, thanks from the uh, all three forums right. uh, no i i mute all uh, thank you very much i mute okay. all and I, I request everybody to give a clap to professor eaton thank you so Thank you.
Ó. Tenta. Vamos lá.